Welcome. Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lily Weinberg, and I'm here joined by my colleague, Alberto Barglin, Knight Foundation President and CEO. Hi, Alberto. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Very well. Great. Looking forward to today's conversation. Me too. I'm looking forward to it. And thanks so much for, for joining us um, on the final conversation of the year for Coast to Coast, episode 21. It's really hard to believe that, that we've done this 21 times. Um, and as you know um, very well, because you encouraged us um, to do this and to start this conversation um, when the pandemic began um, to talk about communities. Um, and really the purpose of these conversations were twofold. Um, one was to, to look at the future of cities, um, especially for building engaged communities in a time of rapid change. And then two, to have practical, practical, tangible insights and takeaways for our communities. And you've really, really pushed that piece, the, the practical piece too. Um, as you know, we've looked at that all, you know, types of topics um, from how to leverage public spaces and technology during the pandemic. Um, as you remember well, we, we talked about um, transformation of streets for businesses and restaurants. And then in every episode, we've really tried to elevate inclusivity and equity as a core component of these conversations. I think it's really appropriate that we are ending our last episode talking to mayors um, around what they're doing in communities, how they are leading. Um, and I'm really excited about today. Um, so Alberto, can you tell us a bit about what we're going to talk about and who we're talking with? Great. I, I wonder if we could have our, our three illustrious guests join us and, and, uh, and show themselves on the video. We've got Jim Kenny from Philadelphia. We've got Vi Lyles from Charlotte, and we've got Daniela Levine Cava from uh, Miami Dade. What they have in common uh, is that they are the, the 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 principal political leader in each of their night communities. I know you didn't, don't necessarily think of Philadelphia first as a night community, Jim, but we think of Philadelphia as a night community. Charlotte is a night community, and so is Miami. And not only that, but these are three supremely, and I know this from personal experience, these are three supremely practical people who actually get the job done while a lot of other people are off giving speeches and doing the talking. And so in light of, in light of the disconnect that we seem to have between national arguments and, and intransigent division, um, we thought we'd look at the the city level, the local level, um, frankly, these are not small places, none of the three of them. Um, Miami-Dade County, Philadelphia, Charlotte are major cities in the United States, but they are led at a level of people. They're led at a level of connection uh, to people and the problems. And so hearing from the folks who, have, who are doing it and doing it best, I think is a is a great way to wind up uh, this series. I'd like to ask maybe uh, to have each of you uh, give just a, a real quick, um, a real quick uh, overview of, of how you're seeing um, the key challenges in your city. And, and please let, we don't have that much time, but I do wanna give you a little bit of time for scene setting, so, so <coughs> context setting so that folks understand these are not, is not meant to be one type of city, is not meant to be one type of solution. But what are you looking at, Vi, Vi in, in, uh, in uh, Charlotte? And, uh, and then we'll move to Jim. And then our newest member, Daniela, who was just recently elected. Um, and, uh, and we'll kick it off, but we'll kick it off with you, Vi, if we can. 
Thank you so much, Alberto. And thank you to the Knight Foundation for giving all of us this opportunity to talk about living in um, this time and importance of cities as we're moving forward. So I'm gonna um, be brief and also tell you, um, answer your question. Um, when two years ago, our city um, talked about our values and the values were diversity, inclusion and welcoming. I think that what we will add to that is equity this time. Um, our city, just like many other cities, have had to react to the um, reality of systemic racism, the reality of um, economic disparities, and the reality that those problems have to be addressed and solved at every level of government. So for me, um, my major initiatives are pretty basic and simple. Um, when I talk about Charlotte and my goals for Charlotte, which have been adopted in so many ways by this community, is that I want everyone to have a place to live that they can afford. I want people to have a decent job. And then what the city's obligation is to make it possible for them to move between those two places, work and home, no matter however they spend their leisure time, that we give them the time to flourish and not just in the ways that we talk about in terms of successful incomes and successful job opportunities, but success in building community and neighborhoods and a civic fabric. Um, I just believe that the simplest way to talk about it is a place to live, a place to work, and the ability to build your own community in a way that's safe and communal and builds back our city. Um, I believe that the racial disparities of um, a Southern city and a Southern state are many, but they're solvable if we acknowledge our history and look at it that way. So thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit <clears throat> about Charlotte, fifth fastest growing city in the country right now, 15th largest city in the country right now. And if you had asked me that question 20 years ago, I probably would have said, that's not us, but it is us. And we are adjusting as we grow and prosper. Alberto? Can you hear me? I unmuted, I muted myself oh. because I had a, a phone okay. call just to prove that this is live. This is not produced. <laughs> uh, that, that, but, and, and I didn't want you to hear the phone. But one of the things that's always been amazing to me about Charlotte is that it is a Southern, a, a city of, of Southern history and tradition, but the tectonic plates of that and the new Charlotte, the new financial center of the United States um, is, uh, is really quite remarkable. I love the focus uh, on community because I think that's where you begin rebuilding trust that we need so much. Jim, what's going on in Philadelphia? Well, let me give you a little, a little bit of background about me. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm 62 years old. I was born in 1958. Uh, I'm a lifelong Philadelphian. I grew up in a South Philadelphia ethnic enclave of Irish Catholicism and, and uh, city of neighborhoods. Uh, and because of my parents' uh, efforts in educating me, uh, getting me through a, a pretty, pretty good prep school at St. Joe's Prep and uh, Jesuit educated, uh, and, then, and then college and, and, and on, um, learned um, that what the city of Philadelphia went through in the 1960s and 70s and began to come out of in the 80s and 90s uh, is still the issue of, of, of race and, and systemic racism. Uh, and I, I view myself as mayor as trying to bring us all together with the experience of the old uh, at growing up and understanding what the new Philadelphia should be. And that is uh, a city that is attractive to immigrants. Uh, most of our businesses are started now by people who were born in other countries, uh, and to bring together the the white the white white people and the and and people of color, so that we can move together as a city. And I honestly believe that because we have such a poor population, uh, that the only real way out of that poverty is education. And we have been investing uh, everything that we can in our education process. Uh, we have obviously had a glitch uh, during the course of the pandemic and the loss of revenue, uh, and um, we're trying to rebuild our rebuild our economy. Uh, we're going to need some help from the federal government in order to do that. Uh, we can't do that on our own, uh, but we really want to continue to reinvest in education. I think that is the most important thing we can do. Uh, we started, we passed a, a beverage tax in Philadelphia, which was not a, not a fun or easy thing to do, I can assure you, uh, but, it's, but it's stood the test of time and stood the test of multiple lawsuits. 
Uh, and that money's going in to pay for a, a quality pre-K education for as many children as we can get in. We believe that uh, that pre-K experience bodes well for them as they move to kindergarten, first grade and beyond and sets them up for success uh, going forward. Uh, we also need to deal with um, investing. State of Pennsylvania is supposed to be the prime funder of our educational process, uh, but they don't fund it the way they should fund it, despite Governor Wolf's valiant efforts to do so. Uh, so we had to pick up the slack and invest that we invested a billion dollars uh, in new money in our school system over the first four years or so of our administration. Uh, again, we've hit a little bit of a roadblock financially. Uh, we're gonna build our way back. Uh, we have set up um, scholarship programs at our community college the Octavius Caddo Scholarship, which is a, represents an individual who was a civil rights leader uh, icon back in the 1860s and 70s. And we resurrected his, his ideas about education uh, and, uh, and racial equity in, in voting rights and the like. Uh, so we're, we're moving forward, all, the, all of our folks together, but understanding we have to look at everything through a racial equity lens. It's the most important thing. As you see in the pandemic, the people who were affected the most were people were brown and black people. Uh, has affected them more than anyone else. And as we work our way back with the vaccine, we have to make sure that vaccine is distributed in an equitable, equitable manner uh, and that everyone's treated fairly. Uh, we are, we'll get out of this that we're going through right now with the pandemic and, and the soon to be thankfully post-Trump era uh, and move, move forward together, uh, interlocked, arms interlocked and, and move forward to make our city the best it can be. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction. I, I know from having heard you speak extemporaneously on this to more, more than once, uh, I don't know anybody who is more eloquent in his, in his understanding uh, and support for uh, the, the, uh, the contribution of immigrants uh, in, in this country as the, as the son of an immigrant and the husband of an immigrant. I've always been particularly appreciative of your, of your uh, sentiments you. on that score. And, uh, you, and I know that you've also used that uh, that tax money uh, for uh, for reimagining public spaces in Philadelphia. Correct. I'd like to come back uh, to that a little bit if I could later on in the program. Uh, yep. But next, let's move to my mayor, uh, Daniela Levine Cava, um, and uh, and welcome, Daniela. It's it's really quite wonderful to see you on this uh, program. I hope you're feeling better. I know you were quite under the weather. Yes, I get to have experienced COVID firsthand and emerge the other side, gratefully. Thank you very much, Alberto. Well, Glad to hear. <laughs> well, this is really an honor for me to be online with two other wonderful mayors. And of course, Lily and Alberto from the fabulous Knight Foundation. Um, you know, you, you, I've arrived. <laughs> I've actually been mayor of Miami-Dade County for one month. And um, I was a county commissioner for six years prior to that. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, I'm the new kid on the block. Also, I'm a county mayor, not a city mayor. Uh, we have 34 municipalities in Miami-Dade County, including the city of Miami, the largest municipality, but Hialeah, Coral Gables, Miami Gardens, Miami Beach, you know, they're all part of, of our county. And uh, as county mayor, we've got uh, 2.5 seven or eight million residents. We've got a $9 billion budget and we are a majority minority community and have been for some time. So we believe that we are what the future of America looks like. Uh, and not only that, but we are paradise. So no offense uh, to the wonderful city colleagues on the line here, but hey, you know, it's pretty beautiful right here in uh, Miami today. My son and daughter-in-law live in Philadelphia so thank you, Mayor, <laughs> for taking good care of them. Um, look, we live in this incredibly dynamic place, um, international, truly a global city, um, dynamic, um, energetic, entrepreneurial, um, and uh, also with people struggling to get by. We have one of the highest costs of living relative to the salaries, we have um, a, a low prevailing wages, uh, we're uh, dominant uh, hospitality tourism industry, which of course has been particularly hard hit uh, by the pandemic. Um, uh, also, you know, foreign investment is a key part of our formula uh, 
fortunately, we're doing better than a lot of the places that like to invest here. So that continues. And we're also um, a great alternative to the cold Northeast and uh, North Central. So we are benefiting from uh, a, 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 an ex, a exodus from some of those places. And you know what? We're working really hard to encourage that. So uh, sorry to, to you in, in Philadelphia and other Northern climes, uh, but your misfortune is our fortune. So um, apart from all of that, we are uh, number one in assets at risk from sea level rise in the world, uh, I guess because we keep building on the coast, go figure. Uh, because of the high cost of living and the low salaries, housing affordability is an even bigger problem for us than I think, you know, look, we could we could argue who has the bigger problem, but for sure we have a huge, huge issue with the highest percentage of people extremely housing burdened, uh, over 50% of their uh, income spent on housing related costs. We do have a traffic nightmare, which was alleviated uh, somewhat during the pandemic and has not come back in full force, but we have a, a very substandard public transit system and working really hard to to bring us into the uh, 21st century, uh, as far as that goes. We are a small business economy. 80% of our businesses are 10 or fewer. And um, uh, you know they're, they're on life support if they haven't disappeared already. And so our challenge is as we emerge from the pandemic, apart from our health, uh, our lives and our livelihoods is to uh, build back that uh, kind of uh, entrepreneurial, uh, hospitality-based um, small business economy, as well as to attract uh, anyone we can from the Northeast and uh, build infrastructure projects, which are win-win-win. So that's a little nutshell of what we're facing here, uh, my one-month report on the job. Terrific. Um, I, I can't, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's impossible to overlook uh, the importance of race and racial equity uh, at this point in American life. Um, and it's, it's also foolish to pretend that we are simply because there's been an election uh, that we're going to now move on and all hold hands and, and, uh, and walk forward together. Half the country, 70 odd million, uh, voted for somebody else than the, than the winner. Um, and so we are divided in any number of ways. I, I, I introduce you all as, as from my personal knowledge of you and belief in you uh, as extremely practical people. As a practical matter, how do we get folks to sit down and stop speechifying and start focusing on accepting what's, what, what the, the, the racial inequity we actually have um, and then dealing with it first the first step toward transformation is accepting the reality, then sharing the vision, then figuring out what to do about it. That first step seems to elude us whenever we talk about it because you hear people giving grand speeches. Your people, you, you folks get stuff done. How are you approaching this in Charlotte? Um, Alberto, you remind me of a saying that my mother used to say sometimes and she'd say, watch my feet, not my mouth. Um, it's a pretty southern saying, I believe, but but it's it it means it has meaning. It really is about not just talking about something, but um, getting some things done. So let me give you a couple of examples of what we've done. Um, first, setting the vision by acknowledging our racial disparity and our role in the um, in the um, issues that be, are exceed beyond just the normal, you know, the GI Bill, not allowing black men to be able to get a loan, um, to not be able to get the opportunity to go to college, all the way up until, you know, where urban renewal took place and destroyed African American neighborhoods in our city. So first, um, acknowledging and, and admitting that this history exists. We have just completed a legacy commission where many streets and, and towns in the South have um, memorials and statues and streets named after the Confederacy heritage and, and the Jim Crow laws that existed, honoring that. And so owning that and beginning to change it. But more importantly, you have to change people's lives. And I believe um, some of the work that actually the Knight Foundation has helped us do 
in terms of building, rebuilding our traditional African-American or people of color corridors where they've had issues on housing and safety of the neighborhoods, um, schools that were failing, all of these things, we have to have a core of people in communities that will believe us. So we have to give them the opportunity to organize, make a plan, and then implement that plan in cooperation with government. And when I say implement, I don't mean you know just window dressing. I'm talking about putting your money um, from the budget and recognizing that you have to do this work. Um, I'm talking about doing municipal services at a level of that makes up for the times of neglect. Um, why our communities are, are, are failing because we didn't invest for so long because they were, were not the places that new growth was happening. So we've got to go back and correct it. So in Charlotte, we've, we've called it um, oppor opportunity, corridors of opportunity. And what we're doing is actually making access to capital for development particularly minority developers to come in and reduce um, the historical downtowns and corridors or centers of these communities. We're also investing um, money in making sure that our operational services, that we're keeping it clean, that we're actually managing it. And then finally, we're having to focus our areas for affordable housing, renovation and rehabilitation. We do not not want to experience the displacement of the 1970s. What we want to do is keep people in their neighborhoods and programs like um, tax abatement programs, which I'm not really allowed to say because that's not what we do, but it basically is the end of the day, allowing people to stay in their homes in an area where the values have increased so much that they can't afford it. We have to figure that out and we've done it in a way that keeps people there but also creates the opportunity for the next generation to also stay there. So the practical part of this, I say is watch what people do, not what they say. Well, that's terrific. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple lesson or, uh, or a deceptively simple lesson. And we're certainly very, very proud to work with you in the West End, particularly yes. uh, our program director there, Char uh, Charles Thomas is uh, is uh, is a is a big uh, is a big supporter of, of the kind of, uh, of practical uh, development of these corridors, as you call them, as uh, as uh, as you are, Jim. In Philadelphia, you've done a, an amazing job in using uh, public spaces, uh, and in fact, uh, such an amazing job that you actually stole our former program officer to yes, go we did. work with you in the in the parks <laughs> department. But how, how are you, how, is that one of the ways in which you're touching neighborhoods? Is that, uh, is that what's driving uh, Philadelphia's uh, reimagining of, of yeah. public spaces? First of all, I'm not apologetic for stealing your guy. Uh, <laughs> we're very, is yeah, terrific. All is fair, all is fair in love and government. So it's- uh, Patrick is terrific, no question. Let, let me just expand a little bit on what, what Mayor Lyles talked about. I think the most important one, one of the most important parts is a starting point on racial equity and, and a discussion of race is getting the story right. The history that I was taught in school wasn't accurate. The history that generations before me were taught in school was also very inaccurate. It wasn't the full story of what really happened. Uh, and when and I love history and I love the context of history as we look forward and try to, to build a better society. We have to acknowledge the fact that African Americans built this country, period on their backs for no money in, in the state of slavery until, until emancipation. And then after that, continue to build this country, fight in our wars, support, you know, work in our factories, do all the things that, that everyone else did and got no credit for anything that they did. I mean, I, one of the most poignant things I've seen is, is, the, is, is an African-American widow getting the Congressional Medal of Honor posthumously for her husband uh, well, from the President of the United States because they wouldn't give it to him back in World War II when he accomplished the feats he accomplished. These things have to be recognized. And, and I, you know, got, thank God I had the parents that I had who would not allow that insipid racism to enter into our lives, and into our home. So I was never raised with that, with that hatred and with that, 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 that um, misinformation. We have to acknowledge what the true story is, get the real history right, and then acknowledge everyone that history and thank people for what it is they've done for our country. 
I know when I see guys on a corner in, in neighborhoods throughout the city that are wearing their military hats, their baseball caps with their insignia and their, and their division and company on it, uh, older African-American men, they went and fought for their country and came back to sit on the back of the bus. I can't imagine how you would stay patriotic as an American living in that kind of environment. So I think we have to acknowledge that, acknowledge our fault, acknowledge the, the sin of our country, and then try to make up for that sin. I think two, two areas we can make up for it. We can never make up for slavery. It's not possible. It's the original sin of America, and we're going to live with it as long as, we're, as long as this country exists. But I think education, as I said earlier, is extremely important. People need to be educated. Our kids need to be educated. And not only just getting a college degree, but I mean science, technology, math, the things where you can actually create careers and create people who can invent things and create things and be entrepreneurs. And that's the educational side. I think the real inequity and the real unfairness is in housing. I think that if you look at some of the struggling neighbors in our city that happen to be African-American, it's the housing that is really the problem. And we really have need a national investment and a, and a local investment in, 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 in decent housing for people where they can have solid neighborhoods, raise children, take care of our grands, have them be in, live, in, live in safety and, and live in the neighborhood that they grew up in. And I think that's really important. And we, 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 we look for development in, in our city, but we also have to temper that with displacement. We have to temper that with gentrification. We can't have great neighborhoods that are building and we're pushing everybody out. One of the biggest... Um, Re re redevelopment projects in the city's history back in the 60s called Society Hill. And Society Hill is a beautiful place now. It's lovely homes. They're all kind of historically significant. Uh, it's safe. It's beautiful. Black people got pushed out of that neighborhood to build Society Hill. And we have to recognize that. And we have to look at in the future that we, as we move forward to expand and develop, that we don't do the same thing that we did to black people in Society Hill and in other neighbors throughout our city. And I think with, with some federal help, from, from HUD and others, we could do those things. I remember when uh, Society Hill was getting built out, I was in law school at the University of Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and, uh, and, uh, that, and there, was a, there was a big push going on back then. That was in the, that was in the 70s. I think that was when Daniela was in high school. I'm not sure. Jim, thank you. I, that's, a, that's a really clear exposition. Um, and yes, I'm still sore that you got Patrick Morgan, but we were able then to get uh, Ellen Huang to, to join us and represent us really wonderfully well in uh, Philadelphia. And Daniela, in, in, in Miami, you've, uh, you, you've got uh, sea level rise that you've already talked about. You've got a, a place where three quarters of the, of the people who are here were born someplace else, one half in a foreign country. Um, what, uh, what, what practical steps do you take to, to bring us together to find common ground so we can go forward? Well, thanks, uh, Alberto. You know, I am the first Anglo uh, to be mayor, you know, for, for over two decades. Um, first woman ever to serve in this role. And, and actually first Jewish person. So, and I am definitely in the minority in Miami. So, uh, you know, I like to say I am the bridge builder because, um, uh, you know, I didn't get here by, uh, by my demographic, right? So uh, we have, you know, about 70% primarily Spanish speakers in Miami-Dade County. Uh, for, and, and it was, you know, started uh, Cuban uh, exodus, but now all the Latin countries, uh, you know, that everyone with troubles, uh, they're, they're here. Uh, and um, the African-American community has become a smaller and smaller percentage of the population, despite also having built uh, the Bahamians that came and, and the original settlers. So uh, it is really a, a, a place where there's a lot of pain on this issue of, of, of disparities. And this was a large part of my campaign focus, saying that we would address head on the disinvestment uh, in, in certain communities that have been left behind. And um, uh, in fact, my main opponent in the runoff uh, said that he wasn't aware of systemic racism. So, you know, hard to address it if you don't see it. I've spent a career dealing with issues of disparities and racism and, and addressing them. And 
you know, if I can't fix it as mayor, then, you know, what good am I? So we bring a very, very race conscious lens to the work, uh, not leaving behind all the others who are struggling uh, and trying to make a better, a better life. Uh, but with that said, I am creating an office of equity and inclusion uh, to make sure that it is visible, that we do talk about it, that we do act on it and very practical. Thank you for that, Alberto. Yes, a common sense candidate. And, and by the way, I'm a nonpartisan mayor, uh, not party affiliate. So that is very, very important because I am a registered Democrat, a lifelong Democrat. And most, even though we're a Democratic majority, uh, of course, no party affiliation is the biggest party, but even though we have uh, quite a few more Democrats than Republicans, we have so many that have fled totalitarian regimes uh, that uh, really bought into the narrative that um, Democrats are, you know, leftists. And so many, many other Democrats on a partisan ticket lost uh, this election. And my election was considered an anomaly uh, as, as a Democrat that's in a Democratic majority. You. Yeah, I mean, that, really. That's, that's because they don't know you. I didn't think it was <laughs> there you go. Thank you people, that. This, this lady's going to win, period. That's right. That's why I said, why well, doubt me? I, because I am a true collaborator, because I really do uh, see the value across all the divides and, and so on. But just like uh, Mayor Kenny said, you have to call it. You have to, you know, if, if you don't see it, if you don't call it, you can't do anything about it. And uh, there's been a huge tension about the lack of acknowledgement of the racial disparity for a few decades. And so we have to be very, very deliberate. Uh, procurement, uh, you know, infinitesimal, what the Black community uh, has achieved compared to others, um, hiring, uh, promotions, um, segregation. And I'll add something to the gentrification front. We have climate gentrification because, again, when you look at our sea level rise, most of our lower income housing was in areas that now turn out to be the more desirable because they're higher elevation. So we have massive. Uh, Kind of in, internecine efforts to buy up properties, which will turn out to be the more the more valuable properties, without really conscious policies anti gentrification. Uh, as commissioner, I brought legislation for um, community redevelopment agencies, which are targeted uh, reinvestment in in disadvantaged neighborhoods, to say that if you're building, you must also build for um, income uh, inclusion, and if you're displacing, you must replace. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have to have that conversation. It is a very critical conversation that I would say in many ways is just truly beginning in our county. Wonderful, and I, and I know that, uh, that our program director here in Miami, Raul Moaz, is looking forward to working with folks in, yes. uh, in your administration. Um, we have just a few uh, minutes before we open it up for, uh, for questions from the audience, but. Um, there are two things that I'd, I'd like to raise, and they're, they're sort of, I don't want to be all over the lot, but they are two important issues. We at night uh, take it as a matter of, uh, of uh, almost dogma that the arts are a key factor in the building of community. And arts in Charlotte, arts in Philadelphia, arts in Miami-Dade uh, are, are certainly uh, uh, an element in bringing people together. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, but 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 um, but perhaps more more urgently, uh, we talk about the values of diversity, uh, but I wonder if you believe that there should be as diverse a set of approaches as we have taken to public health uh, in the United States, uh, where the federal government has basically said the states and municipalities will decide for themselves what's good for them. Um, and there's been certainly some controversy about whether we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been uh, better served by a, by a more national approach to the pandemic. And now as we get to the point of distribution of vaccines, um, there's a fair amount of diversity in how that's going to happen. I wonder if you could tell us, and Danielle, I know that your husband is a doctor, your, your, your focus on uh, having a, a public health officer, I know this is important to you. 
how are you approaching this issue and how do you relate to the feds um, on this district on this very important next uh, phase in fighting the pandemic? Well, uh, if I get to start, I'll say, uh, never mind the federal government, how about the state government? <laughs> you know, you may remember that in the absence of a federal response, uh, you know, a lot was pushed onto the governors and the governors took very varied approaches. Right. And then there were which ones had better relations with the president, right? It happens that our governor has a very good relationship with the president. And that did help us to get early supplies of tests and PPE and things like that. But, as, but, but on the other hand, our governor has um, uh, really restricted local control over response and has really pushed for full opening and things like that. So that, that has been a challenge. Um, you know, we have been fortunate because we do have a major uh, teaching hospital. We are one of the first recipients of the vaccine. I have to tell you, as of an hour ago, in, a, in, in about two days time, 3,000 people had been immunized in Miami-Dade County at Jackson Memorial Hospital. And they, they have set up an incredible assembly line. And of course, we have a lot of skepticism about this as well. So we are working hard at having prominent citizens across um, sectors, uh, across communities, races, ethnicity, speaking up to try to help uh, overcome some of that natural skepticism. Uh, but there's a sense of such excitement, such joy at being at the forefront at what the beginning of the end is how they refer to it. One doctor said it's like being the first person to walk on the moon. That's how they felt about being at the front end of getting this vaccine. So. Um, yeah, we're going to have to, and I, uh, one of the mayors mentioned about the importance of rolling this out in a way that is equitable, but also in a way that takes, that deals with people's fears, which are so very, very real in, in so many of, of these communities. And, um, you know, you need to have those trusted intermediaries across right. all those different communities to, to help to get well, the word a, out and make it real. I think that's a really good, that's a really good point. And cities in a way might just be those trusted intermediaries as opposed to the federal government. But Vine, do you feel we would have been, we, we, we should have had a, uh, a national approach to this, uh, to the pandemic? And, and is this now a time when we really should shift to a local implementation? That's a, a question that if I were just to say, knowing not knowing any more than I do, that we really did need the collaboration, the coordination from the federal government. And, the, um, you know, as being a, a city in a, what um, the president says, a Democrat state, um, we did not have the opportunities that were um, allowed for some of the um, Republican governors and it ended up that we had to work really hard, harder. But I think that our governor, um, Roy Cooper, recognized that we were a state that's very diverse. We are rural, we're urban, we've got quarters, um, we've got different populations, black, brown, and white people everywhere. And he allowed cities and, and counties to take steps that were above and beyond what might be necessary for a different part of our state. And I think in that large part, that has helped us a great deal. But this idea of access to um, our um, vaccines and a part of the disparities that people have experienced, I believe is gonna be very, very difficult for us. It's, it's in some ways, we've got to reinstall some trust that has been broken for four years. I mean, magnify in, in terms of um, the dis, this disparity and, and the lack of um, unity. So I'm hoping that by the end of the summer, as the new administration comes in, we talked about the United States of America, we've talked about the word unity. Can we take those values and incorporate them in a public health model that allows people that really need this vaccine to have it as needed and allows for everyone to be able to participate. As mayor, my goal is to educate, educate, and when available, 
be a model for people to say as a black woman mayor and, and, and a leader here, I've got to step up and say, this is an important vaccine. I'm taking it. And when I can take it, you can take it. And we need that kind of leadership that we're building. And it goes to some of our community building. Our neighborhoods where we try to approach problems like violence, where we try to approach problems like homelessness, those neighborhood leaders are essential to any of these efforts. And that includes the public health portion of it. So we're gonna be reaching out to those, um, com those leaders. It's not always um, at the top. It's sometimes just your neighbor saying, I'm going to drive down and get my vaccine or the vaccine is coming to our neighborhood and are you going to walk over with me? That kind of trust is what we have to have to make this work across our entire community. Well, it seems to me this is a huge opportunity for local government to rebuild trust by, by getting the job done right. Jim, how are you seeing things in, in the biggest oh, community we have represented here in Philadelphia? I think the, the issue in the United States, is, it, it, mar, I'm, I'm marveled at the fact that people actually make an argument that we can't afford health care for everybody. I mean, it's, it's one of the most silliest arguments that, that I've ever heard in a nation that has the wealth that it has. And we've had this kind of false narrative that's been set up, especially in the last four years under this administration, that somehow either you're a capitalist or a socialist, and there's nowhere in between. And then some of the people who are making arguments about being not being socialist are waiting desperately for their social security check every month, which is socialism. Because <laughs> um, people, I will have that argument with people and say, you know what? Uh, they said to me one time, well, Obama's a socialist. I said, oh, well, I don't think so. But do you take that check you get every month? Well, I earned that check. I said, well, you earn half of that check. You earn a portion of that check. And the rest of us contribute to the full check that you get every month. Do you take Medicare? Oh, sure. I take Medicare. I have the Part B, have the Part B, and that's why isn't that socialism? Why is it considered socialism? Everybody's benefits that they get, they earned. Everybody else's benefits that they get, they view as socialism. <laughs> to me, it's just it's so self defeating as a nation, and it hurts us on almost every level. And and, and who benefits and gains? The one percent of the folks who are getting all the benefits of this country to begin with, while the rest of us, middle class and lower middle class and poor, fight over the scraps. There's no reason why that, that should be. And I think that, that if and local, the local governments need to play a major role in this vaccine issue. Uh, we have a wonderful governor who works with us all the time. He, we are the largest city in the state, Pittsburgh's second largest city. He works with them, but he also works with all the smaller communities. He's been a fair and equitable, equitable person. And I trust him uh, when, when this vaccine begins to, well, it's been rolling out already, but as it rolls out even more into phase two and three. Uh, we, and we also need to make sure that we have yeah people of color who stand up and say, I've taken the vaccine, the vaccine is safe, you have to trust me. We have the Black, Black Doctors Consortium here in Philadelphia who have been testing for, for months and months now, and created a rapport with the community. And I think that the organizations like that have the opportunity to really get people's trust uh, because they're going to, we're gonna need their trust in order for them to get this vaccine and get this pandemic out of our lives forever, hopefully. Terrific. I think I really do think it's a it's a huge opportunity for uh, for uh, for the rebuilding of trust in uh, in communities. I see that we've gotten uh, a number of uh, of questions. I did want to um, make sure that uh, that I uh, asked you though about your view of the arts as part of your program, yeah. uh, as part of your policies. Um, I'm going to start with you, Jim, since I know. Yeah. I mean, the arts of Philadelphia, is, and in many many of our cities, is an is an amazing source of of, of uh, employment and excitement, and it feeds other industries. So, for example, the the arts feed the restaurant industry. The restaurant feeds the arts, feeds tourism and hospitality. The museums feed tourism and hotels. So, I mean, this is all a continuum of of of. It's not just the arts itself; it's everything that it feeds. Um, the, the sad part about it is, in order to enjoy the arts, you have to come together in small spaces and closed and enjoy a show, enjoy a play, you know, enjoy a musical. Um, so as, as we get the vaccine distributed, as, as, as this immunity begins to grow in our communities, um, we can bring people together again, and we're gonna have to find ways within the city and state, and hopefully federal government, to infuse some assistance into these organizations, both the, uh, you know, the, the entertainment uh, and arts groups, uh, the restaurants, and the, and the uh, hospitality and, 
and tourism organizations. Uh, and I think we can get there. Uh, and um, again, the most important thing is to get as much of the vaccine distributed as effectively and equitably as possible so that we can all come together again uh, and enjoy, enjoy life. I saw an interview uh, with a, with a, a Broadway, uh, an actor, uh, somebody I, whose name I don't even know, but uh, he said that at the end of the interview it was on one of the news programs, they said, what could people do to support the arts? And he said, wear a mask. Vi, um, uh, what about uh, you and Charlie? And, uh, Everything that um, Mayor Kenny said, but I want to add one other thing. Um, we've got to figure out how to support the individual artists in our community. Um, we have a wonderful performing arts venue, brings in all of our plays, our museums, our art museums, our history museums. All of those are very important. So we have to focus on that, making sure that they can reopen and, and the vaccine is important to that. But I think also that if we're going to um, have artists continue to produce works that are important for the future, that we need to feed this generation of individual artists. And I hope that we'll find ways to do that because those are the folks that are gonna chronicle this pandemic that we've had and how they explain it will often make history more real to those that study it in the future. So that's my hope. Terrific. And you've also got a phenomenal new public library coming online. Phenomenally uh, new. I'm hoping that we get it built. Um, the supply chain issues are resolved as a result of an international effort to stop this pandemic. Wonderful. It is. It is. I'm excited about it because it is also going to be one of the uh, one of the best examples of a modern digital library, as well as a spectacular <laughs> building. Uh, Daniela, and you're in you're in uh, a place where we work very hard to make art general in Miami. What about you? Well, first of all, nobody has done more for the arts than the Knight Foundation in Miami. It's just extraordinary, and truly, we are an art destination. Uh, missed Art Basel this year, but it'll be back and did have our local version. Uh, what's again unique about our art scene is that it's global, that it's homegrown, as well as um, you know, comes from all corners of, of the planet. Uh, and it's a key part of our differentiator as a tourist destination. So um, our Convention and Visitors Bureau incorporates arts fully into the tourism message uh, you know, it's the experience that's different from the cookie cutter. So definitely, definitely um, uh, a key part of our economy. And we've been able to maintain so far our county budget uh, through the pandemic and helping really having a strong sense of, of keeping these uh, organizations in business uh, to get through these, these trying times. I'm very proud of that. And, um, you know, it's the, it, it is really what puts us on the map in so many ways. And you've got one of the best uh, county arts councils, I think. Yes, we, we uh, do. Uh, we've seen yeah. the leadership of Michael Springs. Yes. I, I do want to make a comment, on Jim, on your your uh, your your observation that the arts, the performing arts, certainly require uh, the uh, the gathering of people, and that's simply not possible. And what we've been doing at night has been to fund uh, a number of organizations, and I'm thinking of. Uh, of some in Philadelphia, some here in Miami, the Miami City Ballet, the Wolfsonian, uh, where they are simply taking digital and saying, okay, I can't have you come to the show, but why don't I bring you into the stacks? I, I happened to watch the other day a, a fascinating tour of the stacks of the Wolfsonian Museum of Propaganda Arts. I didn't even know they had those stacks in that building, uh, but it creates, it, it's an opportunity uh, to build a, a different relationship. Lily, do you have any questions we, from the We audience? do, and th this has been a great conversation. Um, we, we do have a lot of questions from the audience. I'm gonna elevate a couple of them um, okay. and to build upon the, the, the most, your most recent comment um, around um, you know, virtual convenings. And, and so there's a question, Mayors, around um, 
public meetings and how you're leveraging technology to better connect to your constituents and and if that's going to really change for the future once this pandemic is over um, you know leveraging technology to um, better connect to your community so would love to 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 hear from you on that mayor kenny do you want to jump in uh technology has i mean obviously we've done all done more zoom and teams calls than than we would like uh, over the course of the last nine, 10 months. Uh, and it has kept us in touch with, with, with our constituents and it allowed us to conduct business in the city and have public meetings and to uh, convene, um, uh, convene folks to do things. Uh, I do think though, somebody who's been in, in politics and government for you know, 30, or 30 years or so, um, it's, it's not the same. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I recognize with folks is that they're frustrated when they do a public meeting and they're on Zoom or they're on Teams uh, and they, get, they can get shut down. I mean, I remember being in city council meetings in the, in the, in the, in the six terms I spent in city council uh, where they would be raucous. Uh, sometimes council members didn't like that and I didn't like it sometimes myself, but it was more, it was more free public discourse uh, than it's, you can get in a virtual setting. Um, and I think people get, the public gets frustrated because it seems as if the people in charge can control the medium uh, because they have the lever on the on the mute button, uh, mm -hmm. where they can put time limits on people's on people's comments. So it is it does. Although we've had to do it, we had no other choice, and it, it's been effective. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to get back in, getting back to getting yelled at in purpose. <laughs> <laughs> You yeah. know, when we talk about this, I think the collective makes a better decision. And I think exactly what Mayor Kenny is saying, when you're on Zoom or any platform that allows for you to have the meetings, it's almost like you're, you speak and someone else speaks. I think it has limited the ability to build a greater ideas and greater solutions. And my, I, I believe that the public being present in the room along with the council gives us a synergy that's necessary for good governance. Um, I know that many people are much more comfortable with technology, but for me, collaboration and, and, and synergy and, and governance, um, those are really important. So I'm looking forward to the opportunity when we can actually, someone can say something and someone can think of a, a better way to make that work for everyone. I think that's what the um, limitations of technology are, unless we can figure out how to do it better. Got it. And I and and Mayor Lyles, you are um, what's really been interesting with with your CARES dollars. You are using some of those dollars to address the digital divide um, to, yes. to get folks connected, um, which I think has been a really interesting um, usage of, of those dollars. I'm going to pivot a little bit. Um, there's a question around um, around the public realm and 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 and, you know, there's been a lot of changes with with how we leverage streets, um, how we, um, you know, use public spaces. There's been record demand of public spaces um, recently. And, and I'm just, there's, there's a question around, you know, how are you thinking that through for the future of, of the public realm and public spaces? Um, Mayor Levine Kava, you wanna jump in here? Well, I wanna start with parks. Yeah. So, and libraries. So parks and libraries were two stepchildren in, our county budget and no more. <laughs> more essential parts of government that that people than people ever would have imagined. Parks, obviously, because we're all safer outdoors and we have the good fortune again, I'll just rub it in a little bit that we live in paradise. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so <laughs> 82 degrees <laughs> today. A, oh yeah. Incredible. So and now that I'm mayor, I have a really beautiful view of the bay, I'm just saying. <laughs> so, um, you know, parks have not been adequately funded. Um, they've been uh, left to, to, to disintegrate in many ways. And now we just can't get enough of them. Um, biking, all of that, everything that has to do with the outdoor spaces. Uh, and then libraries. Libraries, we know, are the great equalizers. I'm very jealous about the Charlotte Library. I've got to know more about it. <laughs> uh, but uh, our libraries were defunded, diminished also, and they became the true um, uh, service providers across the board. 
uh, for access. We even set up uh, virtual access to the internet in the parking lot. We marked off spaces where the internet would reach so you could drive up and participate. They took on the application process for essential social services um, dropping off and picking up of all kinds of essential things. So I just say it's a different look at government providing spaces that are for social good. Yeah, yeah. Mayor, and can I just say one thing? Can please, I just say one please. thing? Um, I'm gonna, I do want to thank the Knight Foundation for their assistance with, the, with Philadelphia on our beverage tax, our sweet beverage tax, because that in addition to pre-K, it's all about parks and, and, and public space. Because when you have good public spaces in your neighborhood, it makes you feel there's equity in your life. Like your city, your community cares about your neighborhood and your kids because you have great play, places to play, great places to contemplate, to lay in the grass, to see a fountain. Um, and, I, and I think not just wealthy neighborhoods should have that, but every neighborhood in the city should have that. They're places of peace and contentment. And I think, Mayor Kenny, the, one of the most interesting in, um, initiatives that we partnered with, with you on was around play streets. Yes. which is such a simple idea yeah. of, you know, yeah. shutting down your, your streets and your neighborhood and turning it into a public asset, which was expanded, you know, during COVID. I just, it's and, so simple, but it's, it's amazing, you know, it's really extraordinary. And in neighborhoods that are struggling, it's safe. You know, I know. The adults can keep the kids safe. The cars are not zooming down the street. Uh, it really is, it really, was, it really is wonderful. And thank you so much. Oh, no. M Mayor Lyles, do you have any, any thoughts on this? I mean, you, you've done some really interesting things with closing down streets, too, um, well, in, in Charlotte. Of course, we're just trying to keep up with Philadelphia and Miami oh. Day. Um, but, you know, the idea that we, um, during the time that the weather was good, yeah. to allow those small businesses that are in the hospitality and restaurant business to be able to build a patio into the public street space, probably made um, it possible for that restaurant to stay open. And so we um, believe that those kinds of spaces for streets are because Charlotte was built around the idea that everybody would have an automobile, including all, if you had five family members, everybody in the five, every member would have a car. And we built all of those roads and we built it so you can drive fast and straight through. But what we realize now is that's not the same value um, one, it, it impacts our climate and our, our air quality. Um, two, um, I, I love, um, I think um, the mayor said something about gentrification is related to climate. In our community, gentrification is the reverse of suburbanites coming mm -hmm. in and wanting to live inside the city. And they don't want to have a car for everyone. And the cost of a car in our state can be as much as uh, $5,000 for all of the things that you have to pay taxes, gas, maintenance, and the car. So, you know, annually. So we need to figure out a way to make it possible that um, we can use streets in a different way that makes the city more livable. Yeah. Yeah, there's a huge equity component to this. Yeah. Um, with that, we we are at time, um, and <laughs> it, it's hard to believe it. It, it flew by. Alberto, um, do you want to make um, yeah, some final I'd remarks? Like, I'd like to, I'd like to make this a, one of the one of the things I most like about Zoom is the backgrounds of uh, of the people that I talk with, and I love the fact that uh, Jim, you've got Octavius Cato behind you. Yes, uh, it is a statue outside <laughs> City Hall of, uh, of a 19th century African American activist in Philadelphia. And I know that you fought for that when you were on the council and put it up while you were mayor. Congratulations. Thank I'm you. He represents the about. only the, he represents the only public place statuary of an African American in the city of Philadelphia. He was, I think it's fantastic. It's, it's, if you think about it, how amazing that is, that that's never happened till just a couple years ago. I love seeing it. And Vaya, some places are taking stuff down. We're putting stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> I see Vaya, a photograph of Charlotte in the background. It looks like you've got building cranes and going. That that city is constantly, constantly uh, rebuilding, reimagining itself. And and Daniela, that uh, that that uh, we we can can adapt and will thrive is useful. Not only is valuable as a as a theme. Not only for the pandemic, but sea level rise, and for the <laughs> bringing together the conglomeration of uh, this multicultural, uh, uh, diverse community that we, uh, you and I both live in. I admire 
your leadership, your integrity, the three of you, and believe in your, your common sense, practical approach to intractable problems. We're going forward with you three. I, thank, thank you, you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Stay well.